here. I'm Jack Leapster. I'm the uh, planning manager for the long range planning uh, group of the county's uh, community development agency. And I want to thank you for coming here tonight, taking the time to get involved. And I'm really glad that the room seems to be the right size. We didn't know if we were going to have 10 or 1,000 people, so it's worked out pretty well. Um, before I get started, then, I'd like to introduce you to a couple other members of uh, the, our planning staff that are here. I, I don't see my boss, so I guess I can say anything. Uh, <laughs> Christine Gibbler. Um, um, Lauren Armstrong here, and Alex Westoff is over there. Um, and they'll all be working on this, this project. And also Lauren is going to be taking photographs, because we love to document these things. So please, if you prefer not to be photographed, just let her know, and, uh, and you know, there'll be no evidence that you were here. Uh, <laughs> we are also uh, videotaping the presentation uh, to post on our website for those people who uh, weren't able to come tonight. Uh, so this project is called C-SMART. Um, that stands for Collaboration, Sea Level Rise, Sea Level Marin Adaptation Response Team. <laughs> the first request I have is if somebody can come up with a better acronym. <laughs> But, but it, it, the title is symbolic of how we want this project to go forward. Um, it's a collaboration of a large number of people uh, working as a team to respond to the challenges of sea level rise, and that includes everyone in this room and all the people in your communities. Now, I should say this particular study is limited to West Marin. Uh, it's limited to the area which is, which is in the coastal zone. Uh, because of the funding that we were able to get for it. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and it, as I say, it is a collaboration. A number of agencies and, and groups are working together. And some of those people are, are in attendance tonight. Uh, two of our the distinguished members of that team are going to be talking to you tonight. Uh, that's Patrick Barnard of the U.S. Geological Survey. and. Michael Fitzgibbon of the Point Blue Conservation Science, which used to be PRBO, which used to be Point Reyes Bird Observatory. I'm sorry, yes? Is this presentation going to be on your website? This presentation, okay, I'll skip forward to that part. The presentation will be on the website. Which um, website is that? Ah, good question. www.marinslr.org. And we have little cards in the back that you can take to help you remember that. We'll also have it up on the screen a number of times. Um, let's see. So this is the kickoff, just to kind of introduce the community to the, the, the fact that we're doing this project and give a broad outline of what we're trying to accomplish. And I, just a word on logistics. Um, the bathrooms are through that door. And then also please let us know if you can't hear anyone or can't hear someone and uh, we'll, we'll make adjustments. Now, uh, Steve Kinsey, our local supervisor here, uh, couldn't be here tonight because he's actually serving on the Coastal Commission uh, in their meeting today. But he is vitally interested in the challenge posed by sea level rise. And he has a few words for you through the magic of video. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, I wish that I could be with all of you. I'm looking out for our coast at the California Coastal Commission meeting happening at the same time in Ventura, California right now. But I did want to weigh in on this important meeting to thank you for being here to say how universally important it is for addressing sea level rise and climate change all across the coast of California. But this privilege that we have to look at our situation right here in Marin County, 
where we don't have tall bluffs along uh, some of our most populated portions of the coast, it makes this an especially important uh, study to take on. Um, we're going to rely on science, we're going to rely on technical advice we've received from many studies that have already happened, probably fill in the gap in some of the research that's still going on. But most importantly, this uh, effort that we're making needs to involve the public because each of us are the ones who are really going to feel the change as it occurs over time. So I want to thank you for being here, encourage you to stay involved, and look forward to working with you to come up with solutions that fit our, our section of the coast. Thank you. Couldn't have said it better if I said it myself. <laughs> Um, and I have been working with the supervisor on this, and it is really something that is, um, uh, those are heartfelt words um, from him. He really believes in it. Um, let's go to the next slide. Okay, there was a study uh, done in 2012 by the National Academy of Sciences uh, National Research Council, uh, looking specifically at the potential for sea level rise on the west coast, uh, California, Oregon, and Washington. And these are some of the numbers from that report. So we did convert them to inches for people like me who don't know how much a centimeter really is and can't remember the conversion factor. Um, but you see that there's a range here, and that's a very important thing for 20 to 20, 2000 to 2030, from one and a half inches to 11 inches, down to 2100, 16 and a half inches to uh, you know, a little over five feet, five and a half feet. Um, and that's something, that range, that uncertainty inherent in, in the predictions is something you're going to hear from you over and over again. Um, it is something that we are building into our analysis. Uh, we, we may show lines on a map, but what we're really looking at is recognizing that those are fuzzy lines. Uh, they are ranges and probabilities, and we have to develop approaches that are robust and resilient to that level of uncertainty. At the same time, we can see the trends. Whoops. This is the oldest continuing recording uh, tide gauge in the United States, and it's right here off of uh, the Golden Gate. And you can see that there's this general upward trend that's about eight inches in the past hundred years. Um, that is expected to increase, and uh, Patrick and, and Mike will tell you more about the science the science behind that. And I, I want to show you one of the things that, that, you know, we're working with a model that Mike will talk about, the, the Okoff model, and these represent the ranges of different reports that have been published over the past several years about how high, from 25 inches to 50 inches, the average sea level will be rising in the period of 2050. But really, these are just, that, that shows you the amount of uncertainty that we need to deal with. So even when we say, oh, by 2050, it's going to be 50 centimeters, it means that what we're really saying, sometime between 2030 and 2070, it might be between 40 and 60 centimeters. So that makes it a hard, the job gets harder to, to figure out what exactly to do, but that's the best we can do at this point. So Marin, uh, you know, many of you know John Muir's quote, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. And that seems to be especially true on our coast. It's a complex and intertwined system, and it's in the middle of profound change. Let me tell you a little about a bit about that T in CSMART, the team. Who's on the team? Well, first, the, there has been gracious funding for this provided by the Ocean Protection Council, 
and the California Coastal Commission. They're helping us um, make this uh, a go. And then, even more important, we're working with a number of agencies as partners in, in the work that we're doing, including the Gulf of the Farallons National Marine Sanctuary, the USGS, Point Blue Conservation Science, Corvi, which is working on public outreach and education, the Center for Ocean Solutions from uh, Stanford and the Monterey Bay area, who are uh, contributing their effort in, in modeling and evaluating uh, e economics, and uh, we're hoping to bring on the, the firm of Environmental Science Associates, which is really a leader uh, in the world in dealing with uh, the engineering aspects of, of sea level rise. Environmental Science Associates. It used to be PWA, Phil Williams Associates. Um, and they are doing work in a number of different counties and they are also doing work on Bolinas. So it's a, we're trying to get the benefit of uh, the overlap there. And certainly the County of Marin with the, the different agencies in the County of Marin most, uh, most closely aligned with us, the, the Public Works Department, their watershed uh, folks and their flood control uh, specialists. And at the same time, there's a lot of other agencies out there that also are looking to these issues. And this is just a few of them that, that we're working with. Part of the reason that we're here is because we have a, a, a wonderful relationship with the, the Park Service and they were able to make this room available. And they're looking at this area, obviously, with the concerns over like the Giacomini, Giacomini wetlands. And we're, we're exchanging a lot of good information. Caltrans has a big state in what's going on. We're also working with other counties like uh, uh, Sonoma County because they're doing essentially the same work for Sonoma County. So we're looking for the cross fertilization and the sharing of information there. Um, and there's a whole big list beyond that. Uh, and we'll be developing those relationships over the next couple of months. But there's another part of that, that assistance, that technical and, and, uh, and knowledge gathering effort, and that's you. You and your neighbors and the people in your community. Um, we, there's a, a, a wealth of information that's uh, in the experience of people who've lived here over time, and uh, we wanna tap that. And then there are going to be some hard choices that are probably going to need to be made down the line. And we want people to be aware of what's involved in making those choices. So really the, the public's involvement in this is uh, paramount. There may be some of you who are, who are willing to go a step beyond uh, just sharing with us uh, the learning that you have and the knowledge that you have to actually working to uh, involve your neighbors, educate your neighbors, and gather information from your neighbors uh, and make it part of the process. And for people who want to do that, and we heartily uh, invite you to, you can uh, apply to be a member of our stakeholder advisory committee. We have, whoops. We have four different geographic areas and we have different uh, topics or interest groups and there are going to be applications uh, for the Stakeholder Advisory Committee or SAC. We'll have the SAC applications in the back after uh, the presentation and it will also, it is also on our website already. So let's talk a little bit about the process that we're going to follow. Uh, we. Our program is funded for two years at this point. Um, and I'll be going over these steps in more detail uh, a little later, but I just wanted to give you a basic idea of, of what this means. We're gonna be taking the, the best available information on best local information uh, that we can on the science of sea level rise. And we're gonna be identifying the human and natural systems that could be affected by sea level rise, we're calling those assets. Um, and then we're gonna be looking at how 
those models of where sea level rise will occur expose these assets to, to basically to higher water. Um, we recognize that some things are more sensitive to, to damage by uh, storms and, and, and inundation than others, like a parking lot would, does you know, better in a, in a storm than a school or a library or in a flood. Um, the, the impacts are more important. So that's a matter of looking at all the assets and determining their sensibility, their sensitivity. We already have systems to deal with emergencies, and so we want to know how those could be applied to the changes that are coming, and that's part of our adaptive capacity that's in place. And also different, different assets are re more resilient, and that's part of their adaptive capacity too. So you take all of that stuff and the adaptive capacity, and that brings us to the analysis of what the potential impact will be on all of the different concerns that we have. Overall, a picture of vulnerability for the coast is what we want to develop. And once we have that idea of what's vulnerable when and why, we'll move on to beginning to develop adaptation strategies. How are we going to cope with that? And go through the possibilities, evaluate them, look at cost effectiveness, um, the, uh, the options that we have, and begin to put them in an action plan. But even though the grant ends here, the work doesn't end there because this is a process that comes back and must go around and around as we learn and as conditions change. So we expect the first part of the process up to this vulnerability stage to take from nine t months to a year, and then we'll be focusing on the response. A word about sea level rise pro projections. You'll probably hear a lot about different sea level rise projections that are out there and more coming online. Um, there are several models, one from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, it's called the Sea Level Rise Viewer. You can Google it and you can start playing with uh, what sea level rise can do, will, will do in your area. Uh, but, and then there's another model from the state of California called CalAdapt. And there's lots of different projections. Um, and we'll be looking at all of those. But the one that we'll be um, focusing on is the one that the, the Our Coast, Our Future team, that team made up of those those partner agencies that I showed you before have been working on, and again, Patrick will be talking a little bit uh, more about that shortly, and Michael will, will talk about the, the viewer that puts it all together. But if there's one thing that you take away from tonight, uh, it's this. No model can always be right. Different models will not always agree. We can't predict the future with any certainty, but that's, not, that's no excuse not to take prudent steps right now to begin to address what we think is coming down the line. Um, so as the scouts used to say, that's what we're shooting for, be prepared. That's, that's our basic bottom line. That's what we're working towards in this project. <coughs> So I'm going to go over these, these different steps in a little bit more detail. The asset and mapping and inventory, this step right here, that, that, that's what we're working on today. Um, uh, and you can see here a whole variety of things that we're, we're trying to collect and put into a form that we can begin to analyze them. Now, much of this data is already available at the county. Um, in, in our geographic information system, for example, we have the footprints of every building in the county at, in a location at, at, on the topography of the county. So that's a valuable resource that we'll be making use of. 
Um, and our partners will be bringing resources uh, and information along. And our, the people who are part of our technical advisory committee will also be contributing them. But there's nothing like local knowledge and there's nothing like ground truthing. So that's what we'll really be looking to the local groups to, uh, and, and the neighborhood meetings that we'll have to accomplish, getting that, uh, finding if that stuff in a, a data system somewhere is really there on the ground and that it's formed. The exposure, again, as I said, it's where and when those assets that we have uh, identified might be exposed to higher seas and storms. And that's something that will change over time. So here's one scenario. This is actually the, a, a 150, this is the Okoff model, 150 centimeters, um, that's about five feet, um, just about five feet, in a 20 year storm. And so you see there are beginning to be impacts along the fringe. Now we have this data at a much finer scale so that we can zoom in and zoom out on it. Can you say that again? Yes. Okay, five feet, five feet, five feet about, 150 centimeters with a 20 year storm, not, not in 20 years, but a 20 year storm, a storm that recurs uh, on average every 20 years. That's, that's a measure of the intensity of a storm. And we'll, again, as Michael will be explaining, we look at um, annual storms, 20 year storms, and eventually 100 year storms to take into account the, the potential that, for damage that we have. So again, sensitivity, how the degree that an asset can be impaired by its exposure. Um, like again, a parking lot versus a, a school if there's a flood. And so we'll be categorizing all those assets that you saw in terms of their sensibility, uh, sensitivity. The adaptive capacity, this is both on the basis of a particular uh, type of asset, again, like a school versus a parking lot, but also a community response. And Marin County is, has done a lot and, and really has a high level of capacity to respond to emergencies. We've had a number of them and, and uh, we'll be utilizing that uh, those capacities and looking at how they might have to adapt to changing uh, conditions in the future. So we're already working very closely with the County Office of Emergency Services and, and we'll be working with the local first responders in your communities as well. And potential impact, um, how will these how will that exposure to water actually affect the systems? That includes the effect on lives, on livelihoods, on, your, on homes, on health, on the local economy and local activities, and on the natural side, on individual species and whole <laughs> ecosystems, and on essential public infrastructure like roads and water supplies and septic systems. Um, we'll be evaluating all those. So how are we gonna do that if we can't really predict the future? Well, one of the ways we're gonna do that is by developing scenarios, possible futures, big fuzzy edged boxes that um, hold within them a set of possible uh, occurrences so that we can see well, what we're ask, ask, we'll be asking the question and trying to get the answer what if this and what if that and how do we prepare for that so we'll probably <coughs> probably be looking at like um, again that number is the number because you can't put a, a range on all the time but the average at uh, 2030 for an annual um, storm 
you know, that might be one of our scenarios. Uh, we might step out a little further in the future with a more intense storm, and then ultimately, like, what's, I won't say the worst case, because we don't know at all that it will be the worst case, but what's a, a worse case, uh, a more challenging case, and hopefully within that we'll, we'll have covered the, the possibilities uh, that we have to account for. So vulnerability is a measure of, of risk. It's the severity of an impact times the, the chance or probability that that impact will occur. And with rising seas, that probability also rises. This is, again, uh, taken from the Okhoff data, but you can see here this area is, uh, you know, I can't read it, but I think it's 100 uh, millimeters uh, or centimeters of, of uh, sea level as you go up and into the future. It, it in, goes in further inland and then in that 100 year storm uh, in the year 2100, it goes back quite a bit further. So those are some of the, what a scenario might physically look like. Um, but there's another complexity, and unfortunately, none of the models to date take uh, uh, a lot of account of this, and it's something that we recognize and we will be taking into account. Uh, and that's that when the sea level rises and storms get more frequent and more energetic, the coast itself is going to change. And so this is data from a 2009 report from the Pacific Institute. It was a statewide report, so it's very, very rough. But it gives you an idea of, you know, yeah, there's a the potential for, for the shoreline moving and hence the, the area susceptible to damage also moving. Um, and we're going to, with, with ESA, we'll be getting some of the best minds in the business to be assisting us on how to evaluate this, this uh, part of the puzzle. Uh, just to finish this part up to the adaptation strategies, so what do we do when we find out what, uh, what the, the possible consequences will be in the future? And there are a number of different approaches that I'll be going into later, but that gets, we'll be evaluating those different approaches against the potential impacts and then developing an action plan that takes into account, again, cost effectiveness and um, uh, what, you know, the, the, a measure of risk and then some judgment and some choices that we as a community will need to make. All right, so I'm now going to introduce Patrick Barnard with uh, the U.S. Geological Survey, the USGS, and he'll tell us a little bit about uh, the OCOF or the OCOF model coming from the Cosmos um, uh, model. I I'm going to let him talk about it. <laughs> All right. This is uh, your clicker. Um, thanks so much for coming out. Yeah, I'm going to talk a bit about some of the science behind this coastal storm modeling system and how it contributes, um, it's going to contribute to the, the CSMART program. Um, so there's a couple things we have to consider here. I mean, climate change is driving sea level rise, but storminess can also vary. And along the California coast, we don't just care about sea level rise, we care about storms. You know from going to the beach here that things happen during big events, and so those kinds of things are the, have to be considered in the future um, to really get a full sense for the vulnerability of a coastline, not just sea level rise, but also storms. So here's, a, I'm going to talk a bit about sort of the background of the state of climate science um, as we know it today, and a little bit of sea level rise 101, just to give you a sense for some of the fundamental assumptions that we make as we do our modeling work along the Marin coastline. So this is one of the strongest lines of empirical evidence for why 97% of climate scientists believe that the Earth is warming. 
This is a, a global map of annual temperature, um, I guess average annually, and this is for the last 130 years or so, so let me, 120 years or so, so let me run this, this movie for you. Okay, so the, the cool colors are colder, the warm colors are warmer, and as you can see as we approach the 21st century, the increase in temperature is, is fairly alarming. So this is a, an excellent data set coming out of NASA that integrates these temperature measurements from throughout the globe. So if this is the kind of thing that doesn't convince you that something is going on, then I can't help you anymore, I'm afraid. So. Okay, so what is the problem? Well, with these warmer sea surface temperatures, this can drive changes in storminess and also sea level rise. So these two major factors then can place additional stresses. Let me see if I got the plan. Okay. Place additional stresses on coastal systems worldwide. Um, coastal flooding alone from sea level rise, exclusive of storms, a study done demonstrates that this could displace at least 200 million people by 2100 globally. Obviously, this has massive. Um, security concerns, socioeconomic impacts um, throughout the world. And that is just looking at sea level rise. This has nothing to do with uh, the impact on resources like drinking water. It has nothing to do with storms. This is, a, this is a major issue globally. In California, half a million people, a million jobs, and about $100 billion in property are threatened by climate change over the next century. But this is not a problem that is just some, somewhere around the future, several generations from now, we can have storms this winter, and as a matter of fact, there's a, a very strong probability there'll be an El Nino winter coming. Um, but for example, back in 82, 83, El Nino storms caused more than $200 million in damage to California. So it's not a coincidence that there are these kinds of coastal structures built in places like Stinson Beach. We expect these storms, they come fairly frequently. We know what the impacts are but these impacts will be compounded by sea level rise through time. So a little sea level rise 101. So how does sea level rise? There's a couple of, of major factors why we're experiencing and will experiencing more global sea level rise. First, as sea surface temperatures increase and the ocean warms, warmer water expands. It takes up more volume. Secondly, from the melting of land-based ice from ice sheets and glaciers, um, adds mass uh, to these ocean basins and you get sea level rise. So that's sort of the global picture. But then locally, there's lots of other factors regionally and locally that can contribute to sea level rise. I mean, all you care about in Marin is what you are seeing. So if your coast is going up, you're seeing less sea level rise from tectonics, for example. If your coast is subsiding, you're actually seeing less. A place like San Francisco Bay, which is a lot of development is built on bay mud, which is slowly sinking, you're seeing more sea level rise than the average person, because you're actually sinking by one to two millimeters a year. Even if sea level rise is not going anywhere, it looks to you like there's sea level rise, and ultimately that's what you care about in the end. So these other factors, such as vertical land movement, uh, surface and deep ocean circulation, and there's also uh, terrestrial water storage from damming. It's been shown that uh, the many hundreds of dams that have built, been built in China have actually restricted the amount of sea level rise over the last several decades because they've impounded so much water. It's, it's sort of in the noise, it's literally just a few inches here and there, but it is a factor. And there are other factors as well. Uh, ocean basin configuration on geological time scale. So when we had very small ocean basins, several hundred million years ago, sea level was as high as 700, 800 feet than it was today. Uh, and then you get the much smaller scale processes like winds, uh, wind patterns, outlet to decadal. Right now in the Central Pacific, they're experiencing very persistent winds, which is raising sea level over the last decade or so, the fastest rising rates of sea level rise in the world. Um, tidally, of course, the water goes up and down um, uh, daily and up to you know, hourly and decadally, actually. There's these long-term tidal signals based on the, the Earth's orbit. And then storms on the order of hours to days. So there's all these different factors. Ultimately, what you care about in Marin is what is the water level at the coast and how does it impact my livelihood. So, and just as an aside, um, 
as sort of a, I guess a, a fun or not so fun fact, there's about on the order of 80 meters of sea level rise stored in these big ice sheets in Antarctica and Greenland. So that's one reason why we're so concerned about the stability of these ice sheets. Now no one is suggesting that this is going to occur any time in our lifetime or for many, many centuries or even perhaps millennia, but we have been ice free in the past and it's possible to be ice free in the future at some point. But uh, there's a lot of talk right now about some of these um, fringing ice sheets in Antarctica, how they could contribute as much as five meters of sea level rise over a relatively short amount of time. And part of the uncertainty in some of these projections you'll see is that scientists just don't understand at this point how quickly these ice sheets will respond to temperature changes. Here's, a, I think, a very good display over at Chrissy Field um, along the northern San Francisco shoreline, putting sort of putting in a real world context some of these benchmark levels of sea level rise. So if you look at the bottom here, this little ball, this is basically just the low end of predicted sea level rise exclusive of storms. If you look at this higher ball here at closer to 10 feet, this is a, a very high rate of sea level rise in a 100 year storm. And then uh, up here, this is if the entire Greenland ice sheet melted, we'd have sea level rise up here. And if the entire Antarctic ice sheet melted, we'd be up to the deck of the Golden Gate Bridge. Like I said, that, that kind of levels are, are far, far in the future. We're talking about a millennia potentially away. However, the kinds of emissions that we're pouring into the atmosphere are putting us in a, a trend in that general direction that could occur someday. So what's been happening recently? Okay, so based on measurements throughout the world, sea level rise is accelerating. Over the course of the 20th century, we have very good measurements. It's been going up about two millimeters per year, uh, which equates, as Jack mentioned, about eight inches or so um, per century. But over the last uh, 20 years or so, the rate has increased by about 50%. And this is based on satellite altimetry, which is basically radar um, from a satellite, which is um, very accurate coupled with tide gauges. So we have a very good sense that there's an increase in the rate of sea level rise. But the amount of sea level rise is not uniform. And this is what this map shows. This is a map of sea level rise rates over the last 20 years or so based on this satellite um, altimetry work. And the factors that cause this variability in sea level rise are things like ocean circulation patterns. Wind patterns, I, I mentioned these persistent westerly winds in the central Pacific um, and the western central western Pacific here has led to rates as high as one centimeter a year, about five, five times the global rate. So these, these folks in these islands like the Marshall Islands, like Guam, Kwajalein, are, gonna, are among the first major climate refugees, they're experiencing Storms now, coupled with sea level rise, they have not seen before with this kind of frequency. But there's also some other very interesting factors that are get very complicated, and this is called sea level rise fingerprinting. And this is uh, related to the gravitational attraction of ice sheets and how it basically deforms the gravitational field of the Earth. So let me just, just say this briefly, but the bottom line is that if you see this bulge in sea level rise around Greenland, that's because you have a very massive body of ice. It's actually a pulling and attracting water levels up. Now when this ice sheet melts, it actually, you actually have sea level rise fall around Greenland, and essentially the further you are away from Greenland, the more increase in sea level um, you will have. So when Alaskan glaciers melt, when the Greenland ice sheet melts, when the Antarctic ice sheet melts, it creates a variable pattern which is reduced closer to the ice front and increased the further away you are. And this is called sea level rise fingerprinting. So as a matter of fact, we actually care about what happens in Greenland. Even though it's not uniform, we get more sea level rise um, from the Greenland ice sheet melting than Greenland does. So now why do we care about storms? So we talked about sea level rise so here's just an example of sea level rise and coastal water levels along the California coast. So most tools are very good screening tools, but they only consider sea level rise, which by 2100 in California is projected to be about a meter or so, about three feet, and the tide, which varies by about two meters along um, this part of the California coast. So that's about three meters or about 10 feet are accounted for in sort of most simple screening 
tools. However, as I mentioned, storms are when things happen in California. That's when we see major impacts. We want to be able to address the full range of vulnerability, not just from daily sea level rise, which is very important, and the kinds of tools like the NOAA Sea Level Rise Bureau that do this give you a very nice indication of what you'll experience every day. However, there's lots of other components of water levels along the coast, which ultimately lead to flooding, which we like to understand to get a full assessment of how vulnerable that part of the coast is. So there are seasonal effects. Um, during an El Nino winter, the sea surface temperature is warmer, the water expands, and we get elevated water levels of anywhere from about 10 to 30 centimeters or up to basically about a foot for the whole season. So that's the equivalent of roughly, let's say, 40 years of sea level rise um, based on today's projections. So those El Ninos are very important. All of a sudden you've raised water level by 30 centimeters and then you have a series of storms on top of them. The second major factor is storm surge. So when wind blows across the continental shelf, it stacks up water along the coast, it raises sea level. During storms, the pressure is very low. It allows the ocean to expand and that increases sea level as well along the coast. So those two factors together, the wind, the inverse barometer effect are called storm surge. And we get about a meter of that during an extreme event in this part of California. And this is nothing like what, what can be experienced in the Gulf of Mexico that can get eight and a half meters of surge from a, a huge event or roughly 25 feet of storm surge. Here it's more like three feet. It's a very, very big event. However, it needs to be considered. And then the two components that drive up water levels along the coast from waves. One is wave setup. So when waves break, they elevate the surface of the surf zone above what you see outside the surf zone. During an extreme event, this can raise water levels along the coast by about one and a half meters or about four or five feet or so. And then the individual wave bores run up onto the beach. And if you've ever you know, walked along the Point Reyes coast or along the Stinson, like along sea drift during a storm, and you're walking in ankle deep water and all of a sudden it's up to your waist. That's wave run up and often called surf beat, infragravity energy. And so if you exclude these kind of dynamic processes that occurred um, seasonally or during storms, you're looking at, you know, four or five meters of potential coastal water level increase and in vulnerability that you're not taking into account when you're looking at these, at these simple screening tools. So here you're looking at a 10 feet variability of sea level rise, but you can then add another, say, 12 to 15 feet of coastal water levels during an event. That's what we want to model. We want to capture all those processes. So just an example, here's Stinson Beach with 50 centimeters of sea level rise. Looking at sea level rise only, no waves, no wind. We see some minor flooding here. Most of it looks like it's coming um, from Bolinas Lagoon side. But then if we add just an annual storm, take into account these dynamic processes, you see a much more significant impact. So this is what we want to do with the Cosmos modeling system is give you a, a very sort of real assessment of the potential vulnerability of the coast by including all these dynamic processes in addition to sea level rise. Okay, what's been going on with storms? Um, you know, IPCC has stated that there's very likely going to be increase in the, in the magnitude and frequency of storms, and this is spatially variable. So the question is, are we going to get bigger waves, bigger storms um, for this part of California? This is, this is what the empirical evidence suggests so far. So this is a study done looking at low pressure, low pressure centers, basically anticyclones, um, in the North Pacific over the last 50 years or, show, or so. And there's a lot of variability, but there's a very... Um, clear upward trend in the number of these storms in the eastern North Pacific. So this would suggest that we're, gonna, we're seeing more storms. But what about waves? Well, there's a study done back in 2006 which shows that waves are getting bigger and the bigger waves are getting um, bigger faster. So the further north you go, the bigger the waves have gotten over the last three decades. The further south you go, say down as far south as the Point Conception area, Puerto Aguayo here, there's a very little, not too much of a trend. Up here in the Half Moon Bay, sort of Point Arena area, there's a, a slight trend of increased wave energy. In the Pacific Northwest, the biggest waves are getting bigger at about 10 centimeters a year, um, which basically equates to about three feet per decade. So the waves are clearly getting bigger the further north you go, um, not so much in this particular area. Is there any, any reason for that big drop in 
it, there's a lot of variability in the data, and so there's long-term trends, and then there's you know sort of interannual variability, which cannot probably be explained um, by climate models. It's just it's the kind of thing you experience. For example, in 2008, we had one of the smallest wave energy years of the last several decades, and then the very next winter, El Nino 2009-10, the wave energy was 40 percent higher. So it's part of the interannual variability that, it, that is experienced along this part of the coast. I don't know what sort of climate phenomena were going on in that particular time. Yes, sir? That scenario you had for uh, Susan H. Mm -hmm. um, where um, uh, the sea drift that right. was, that was covered. Is that present? You're talking about a present storm? That particular one was 50 centimeters of sea level rise. Yeah. So we're talking about a 2050, 2060 type of range, um, depending on which sea level rise uh, rate uh, you like. So projections for San, Fran San Francisco area, basically the greater central, north central coast area. This is based on the NRC study that Jack mentioned. And so the target is about 30 centimeters or about one foot of sea level rise by 2050 and about 92 centimeters or three feet by 2100. But there is a very large range here. You could call it uncertainty. Um, there is certainty that we will get to these numbers. Um, the uncertainty is when we will get there. Uh, there is, I would say, close to zero disagreement that we will reach these numbers sooner or later. But we've, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, the amount that we're emitting, if we stopped emitting today, we'll get to these numbers. The upper end suggests we could have as much as, you know, five plus feet of sea level rise by 2100. These are based on different emission scenarios, di different socioeconomic factors as the century goes along and also related to our increasing but still relatively poor understanding of how these big ice sheets are going to respond to increases in global temperatures. So what about storms? Well, several studies have suggested using global climate models that there are, are going to be no significant changes in wave heights for the north central California coast. However, the bigger events are projected to approach more from the south. So some of these areas like sea drift, for example, and I, I'm going to keep picking on Stinson Beach, but it's, it's an easy target, I'm afraid, in some of this work. But some of these areas are going to be more exposed to this more subtly wave energy of the extreme events based on these projections. So what's the net effect? Well, today's 100-year coastal water level event with sea level rise added on um, is going to occur about every one to five years by 2050 for much of California. So the event that has a 1% chance of happening today could happen almost every single year in about 40 years or so. And the greatest impacts are going to be on these low-lying coastal areas like Stinson Beach, like uh, southeastern Tomales Bay, um, like San Francisco Bay. <coughs> yes, sir? Uh, essentially, are you saying a winter like 82 to 83 uh, every one to five years? Yeah, that could happen much more frequently, exactly. Yeah, I've seen that charted about five times now. Mm -hmm. The highest uh, water levels on your chart. Exactly. It is. It was, yeah. Those are the highest, still the highest recorded water levels of the four point tide gauge on anomalies on record. Yes. Okay, and on top of that, you have sea level. Correct. And so kind of get back to this point of uncertainty. Um, this is a projection. Some of these models now are going out several centuries. You know, we can argue about the target for where we're going to be at 2100. Is it going to be a meter and a half? Is it going to be half a meter? But the amount of CO2 stored in the atmosphere, we're on this progression where we're going to get there eventually, whether it's at 2100 or 2150 or 2200. We're going to get there sooner or later. So in some, in some sense, it's a moot point. Um, of course, it's not so much for planning that has to go on these sort of 20, 30, 50 year time cycles. However, we will get there sooner or later. So what are the kinds of things we might expect if we have um, higher sea level rise coupled with these extreme storms? Um, accelerated beach erosion rates for many areas. Uh, greater incidence of cliff failures. And this is Pacifica down south of the Golden Gate where there's been documented um, significant cliff failures without sea level rise, uh, the landward translation of coastal flooding and inundation, uh, more dangerous navigation conditions, 
and beach and shore safety more often compromised. So we developed this coastal storm modeling system, or COSMOS, as a tool to hopefully broadly assess the areas that are going to be most susceptible to these kinds of impacts. So it's a physics-based numerical modeling system um, designed for the west coast type of setting. It predicts coastal hazards for the full range of sea level rise and storm possibilities um, using what we, uh, you know, what we would stipulate are the most sophisticated um, global climate and ocean modeling tools. And these tools have been developed with feedback from a number of folks like you and also from federal, state, and uh, local governments. So we can basically custom tailor these tools to directly meet planning and adaptation needs. Bottom line, you can do all the science in the world. If it's not used on the ground, you know, what's the point? So I'm just going to really broadly show you how this modeling system works. Um, we're trying to scale from global climate forcing down to local hazard projections. So we use the latest global climate models, which provide the best um, projections of how the atmosphere is going to be operating over the next century or so. We take the winds and pressure fields, mostly the wind for the waves, but the, these output from these global climate models, the wind drives a global wave model because we actually care about waves coming out of the Southern Ocean. We care about waves in, uh, up in the Aleutians, and that's especially these, these, uh, very, these low pressure centers, these anticyclones that track across the Northern Pacific is how we get very big waves in this part of the coast. And then we scale down to the very local level. So we're going from grid cell sizes that are several hundred kilometers wide, you know, 300 miles or so, down to a footprint on the ground of about five feet or so. So the idea is to get this global, these changes in, in global weather patterns essentially and scale them down so we can make projections on the, on the ground and sort of the sub-parcel scale. And we, along the way here, we bring in tides, we bring in waves, as we mentioned here, we bring in these uh, El Nino effects with the warmer water during the winters, um, et cetera. So that we're, uh, in the end, we're down to this very local scale and you can understand throughout the Marin Coast which parts you need to be ultimately concerned with. And in large part, the grids are, are fairly coarse in terms of the, the model physics on the order of about 100 meters or several hundred, several hundred feet. But there's a lot of areas of, of heightened interest on the Marin Coast, for example. Maybe they're um, complicated topography and bathymetry, basically the depth. Uh, difficult places to model where we need more resolution to get to get a good answer that that's usable and um, credible. So we build in high resolution models in places like Tomales Bay and Drake's Estero and Bolinas Lagoon, so we can get the resolution to resolve the coastal flooding potential at all these um, potentially vulnerable sites. <laughs> and then what about the number of scenarios? So we're trying to basically model every possible scenario for every possible use. So these are the storm event and wave conditions. We look at the average daily conditions in the future. We look at the annual storm, the 20-year storm and the 100-year storm, which is the 1% chance um, storm in any given year. And then the full range of plausible sea level rise scenarios over the next century and beyond. So zero to two meters, or about zero to about mm, six and a half feet or so in 25 centimeter increments, so you have 10 different sea level rise scenarios to choose from, and we combine those with the storms. In the end, we have 40 future scenarios. Michael's gonna walk you through the tool that shows you how you can look at the impacts of all of these. And that's what Point Blue has done so well, is served up what amounts to about 50 gigabytes of data on the fly in this user tool that's extremely user friendly. And uh, this is basically how, it, just to give you a really quick run through here, this is obviously the end of sea drift, and Michael's gonna talk more about this in a second, but you can choose what you care about. Do you care about flooding? Do you care about waves? Do you care about tidal currents? Do you care about the uncertainty of the model? And there is uncertainty in the model. All models are wrong. Some are useful. That's like a rule to live by right there. <clears throat> so you choose what sea level rise you want. In this case, I've chosen one meter, about 3.3 you know, feet for uh, this area. And I said, okay, I don't want to have a storm at all. And so if you look out one meter of sea level rise, 
And these green areas here are areas that are below the flood elevation, but not connected to the ocean. So they're not flooding unless there's a failure of a levee or a berm. So, so here we're seeing just a little bit of flooding from sea level rise alone on the outer part of sea drift. But then if we add a 100-year event, we see how the potential impacts can change considerably. So that's why we want to bring in storms to the picture, because we don't want to give someone a false sense of security by looking at only sea level rise. However, this does show you the conditions that would be basically every single day. And then during an extreme event, this is the kind of flooding that you might expect. <coughs> so I'm going to turn it over to Michael. We're working on a few other efforts now. One is extending this work all the way up to Point Arena. That's going to be done next year. And working with the, the, our Coast, our future team in San Francisco Bay, we're about to release Flood maps next month for all of San Francisco Bay, including the Marin shoreline as well, if you're interested in that part of the Marin County coastline. And then we're also doing some work in Southern California coming up, but I know nobody cares about Southern California here. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Go ahead. You mentioned the, the uh, Pacific Decimal Oscillation mm -hmm. and how it's for 20 or 30 years been extremely affecting the Western Pacific, but a group of scientists of your, your agency and others in 2010 said that the chances of that changing, shifting because of the variable winds could mean that we would get a much higher sea level rise. Can you just speak to that? For Absolutely, yeah. So we've been experiencing very persistent northwest winds, which are upwelling favorable, which there's speculation that's linked to the, the PDO, Pacific Decadal Oscillation. So in effect, we've been suppressing sea level rise along the U.S. West Coast, and the records show that, um, whereas in the, in the Western Pacific, um, sea level rise has been much, much higher. As I mentioned, rates of about one centimeter per year. That can't go on forever. Eventually, there's got to be sort of a sloshing back, and it may be related to when the PDO switches. That's not really been determined, but eventually we could have higher rates than the average globally as opposed to lower rates than the average. Yeah, good question. I can turn it over to Michael and we can talk more later. And uh, again, this is Michael Fitzgibbon from uh, Point Blue Conservation Science. Hello, thank you for uh, letting us come and talk to you tonight. Thank you. Uh, what are, how should I advance the slides? Just there's a, is there a clicker diddly bop? Patrick stole the clicker. Did you steal it? Was it? Here it is. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay, great. You're Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for thanks for letting us be here. Uh, so I work at uh, Point Blue Conservation Science. The person who on this project is uh, uh, the the uh, lead for uh, this C Smart project is uh, Dr. Sam Veloz. Uh He would have been here, but uh, he just had a baby yesterday. Oh, yeah. So he did. He had a little baby boy. So um, so I'm going to start off by just. Uh, uh, we've talked, to, we've sort of, we're, we're giving you a bit of a fire hose of information, but what I want to try to give you is some context for when you, if you go to our site and use this tool, and I want to start by talking about weather, which has nothing, well not, as we now know, it doesn't have nothing to do with sea level rise, but if you want to get a weather prediction, um, and the way that most of us do it is we go to the newspaper, we might go to the National Weather Service website, and we get a, a weather prediction that looks something like this that would tell us in a few days from now that there'd be some patchy fog, 72 degrees on Sunday. And the further out that that prediction goes, we know that it's less certain and that there's probably, might be 72, might be 70, might be 75, maybe a little more certain as to what's gonna happen tomorrow and such. But it gives us a really sort of succinct, uh, crisp summary now, if you were a professional who, in some field that needed to rely on the weather for your living, say you were, a, I don't know, a farmer or you were a pilot, airplane pilot, this is not enough detail, right? You need to know, so like, what's behind that? How, how certain are they of those predictions? How much wind, how much, you know, all the other weather aspects? So. For those people, they want to know the details, right? And they're getting information about infrared and visible uh, uh, bands uh, from satellite views and how much water vapor. And this is actually the exact same uh, 
uh, forecast is this, but this is in language that a professional cares about. So the reason I'm framing this up is that some of you may be um, weather nerds and maybe you really like understanding all the details and some of you may just want to go and find out is the is tomorrow going to have a little sunshine or is it going to have a little rainy cloud so our site the our coast our future site it's the site for professionals so you're going to really get the details you're going to get all of the gory details about um, sea level rise you're not going to get a succinct hey here's what it's going to be like uh, at the turn of the century and Jack and Patrick have talked a lot tonight about how much variability there is. And so we'll kind of walk through the tool. And this is just to give you a sense of what you might expect if you were to go to the site and take a look at it. And we do invite you to go there. Uh, but it is, a, uh, as the, the uh, introductory paragraph says, it's a tool for providing information about sea level rise for San Francisco Bay to planners, land use managers, and also the local science community as well. So we do have a place where you can go, and if you're really interested in, in digging into this, we have a getting started place that basically tries to be a more or less a cookbook of sort of step-by-step. -step. You can create an account, some links on how to get familiar with the project, and lots of background information that might be of interest to you. And here's the tool, as you've seen in some of the other the other slides basically is sort of over on the left side are, are the things you can turn on and off. The stuff over on the right side is going to show you what, you've, what you're seeing, so it's a legend. There's a few tools up along the top and a search bar if you want to zoom into a particular place by an address, say. So over on the left side is where you're going to be turning on and off all the variety of, of, of uh, levels. And where's the, which is the, the pointer? Oops, that's not the pointer. <laughs> that wasn't good. Which, oh, thank you. All right. So Patrick talked about sea level rise scenarios, 25 centimeters up to two meters, and then a five meter scenario. And then the various storm scenarios of none to 100 years. So this is where you can actually choose and actually look and see and compare just by going over it, clicking those and the map will change um, magically. So here we are zoomed into Bolinas Lagoon. Again, we've kind of gone through this, but this is always uh, just to refresh your memory. Uh, so here we are, we are at zero, zero, which means basically if you were to go out there right now, this is effectively what you're going to see. So you're going to see some of the lighter blue areas are going to be showing you what is, what is, quote, flooded. So along a beach, if you think about the waves that are running up on the beach, that's in essence what's the uh, amount of flooding that's happening, which is just normal uh, wave action that's happening. Now let's add a 20-year storm and we start to see more inundation moving inland along the beach, we then switch. We're gonna turn off the 20 year storm and turn on the 50, the 50 centimeter scenario. And you see that actually the amount of inundation on the beach along Bolinas Lagoon is about the same as what there was. Let me go back. So pretty similar, a little different. You know, you can look at the, again, this is what you can do in the tool of sort of going back and forth going, why is that, what is, how are they different? And you can start to see, and you start to get a sense of sort of how, what the modeling is actually trying to do in terms of looking at the actual wave processes that are happening at a global scale and affecting things when there is no storm at 50 centimeters of sea level rise. But it's the combination that then you start to see the effects of what happened when you have a modest amount of sea level rise and then you add to it one of those storms that Patrick talked about. And then you start seeing, at least in this case, some, uh, some parts of Highway 1 are starting to flood as the, per the model. Doesn't necessarily mean that Highway 1 is flooding because realize what the model is taking into account is looking at a, a model of the shape of the earth. So the flooding is, uh, and the, how the models work are also based on the shape of the earth. The model does not know the contours of Highway 1, doesn't know how much slope there is, how much variability. So there's a macroness to this that you have to remember 
that there is a resolution in terms of what you're seeing in terms of the amount of inundation and exactly what's going to happen in these lower lying areas is very dependent on what the really small conditions are in these areas so again you have to sort of think about this a little bit kind of squint your eyes a bit as you look at these things and and uh, as you go through scenarios, this again is looking into the future and there's a lot of variability. We'll talk about that here in just a minute about how that's, how we try to visualize uncertainty. So now let's move over to Muir Beach. Uh, this is, so what do we have turned on? We've got 75 centimeters of sea level rise, a 20 year storm, and we see that the flooding uh, the models are telling us that, ah, the parking lot's fine. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes, I, I see you've been listening. Okay, so uh, you know we're now going to switch and we're going to turn on the uncertainty layer, which is going to show us visually the minimum and the maximum that the model is telling us in terms of how much variability. Showing variability is really kind of, it's a, a challenging things to try to show variability on a map. But what this is showing is that the darker gray is sort of the minimum scenario and the darker brown, the lighter brown, that sort of shoe brown is, is showing what would be the, the, what the maximum inundation that the scenario is telling us. And so from that, we can see that the model is saying, yes, there is a chance um, that we could be getting flooding on that parking lot. Again, I always think about this in terms of like a weather prediction, there's a chance of rain here, right? So you have to take into account and think, depending on what, as Jack was talking about, depending on what it is you're trying to protect here. Is this a parking lot? Is this a hospital? What's the, what is the impact and how much risk are you willing to take in terms of the impact of that amount are you willing to take that risk of this amount of variability with that project? So uh, the one thing that the tool does not, in fact, let me back up here for a second. You don't see anything over here on the right side about dates. So this talks about uh, topics and there's uh, sea level rise and storm scenarios, but as uh, both Jack and Patrick have talked about, when will these sea, life, sea, sea level rise scenarios happen is also important. And we have another tool that those guys have shown, which basically tries to take what are the, the, uh, the, the most uh, commonly used models for Cal or uh, uh, consensus for California. The most recent being from the Natural Resource Council was a, a report that they did for the Western Governors Alliance or Association, I always forget which it is. Uh, but that is sort of the best level of estimates that the state of California is using so in terms of how much sea level rise by 2070, well, that, that estimate says between 25 and 100 centimeters. So that's between about mid-calf to about mid-torso on me, right? So that's a, that's a fair bit of variability. So if I'm, uh, depending again, what it is that I'm interested in, that, that amount of variability could be important, might not be as important, but that is at least the range of what should be taken into consideration given current understanding and consensus. And you can ask in this tool the question the other way around, which is, okay, so based on those consensus, if I'm interested in planning for sea level rise of 25 centimeters, when will that happen? In this case, it would say somewhere between 2030 and 2080. So this is a tool that, that you can use to sort of ask questions about when and then go back to the, the Okoff tool and then look at those specific um, scenarios. There's other data in here, and this is also some of the other information that also helps to give, that Patrick used in, in his models to build and give those actual flood extents. And this one is wave height. <clears throat> That's pretty easy to understand. Another, which is wave current. So this is how fast is the ocean moving at a given spot. Uh, so you can see that in this, in this particular scenario, as you got closer to the shoreline, um, the, the current uh, increased in velocity. And you'll, it's, it's very, one of the things that's very interesting to do, which is to look at, not necessarily at this layer and go, gosh, that's really interesting that this was a 
getting somewhere between two meters and three meters per second at this spot, but it's also to look at the different scenarios or the different storms frequencies, and you see that the velocity in the model, how the, how the model um, uh, created this velocity layer changes, and it's changing based on all the physical characteristics and all the parameters. So this is a really complicated set of interactions, and this helps give you some sense of what's going on behind the models. There's also a tool, and this is a common thing that, the, that professionals are interested in, which is I'm interested in planning for a given area, and you can throw a boundary at this tool, and it will spit out a summary of all the different, all the 40 scenarios of all the various levels of sea level rise and storm surge, and tell you percentage of, uh, air, of inundation, as well as uh, the average flood depth for that area. So it's uh, sort of a handy way of getting a summary for a, a given spot that you might be interested in. And then finally, for those people who uh, are GIS professionals, such as the County of Marin, you can download data from the tool uh, and load it into your own geographic information system of your choice and do your own ma maps and analysis. So this is the website. So again, it's sort of like, just think of it, we are, this is, the, this is the detail behind the weather prediction. If that suits your fancy, go here and register and have a look. Thanks. How about a hand for both? Uh, <laughs> There's a lot of work that went into all that. <laughs> I'm gonna try to wrap up really quickly because I do wanna have some time for questions. Um, and I want to try to get you out here not too much later than we promised. Um, we'll go back to, okay, now that we have that and we're trying to understand it all, what are we going to do with it? Um, and as I showed you before, there are various different strategies. So let me just give you a, a, a brief overview of what that might look like. This we've seen right here locally. Um, this is the, the strategy of go up and get out of the way of the tides and waves. And um, I think I may have glossed over that on the, uh, the page where I was talking about the OES, and I, I want to go back to that. Uh, as Patrick said, the, we are going to see the effects of sea level rise in storms and in tidal events, the extreme events, before we actually see the water up to our knees. That's how it, uh, you could see in, in that sloped diagram that he had, that's what comes first. That's how we're gonna feel it. And so that's probably also where we're gonna need to do our most immediate work in terms of being prepared for it. And this is one step you know, that, that might be there. And um, for example, getting out of the way of the, the uh, storm waves is part of what you have to do to meet the Federal Emergency Management Agency's requirements in order to qualify for, for uh, the National Flood Insurance Program. And I'll get there in one second. Um, and that is something that uh, FEMA is working on right now. Uh, you may know that they are, they are updating their studies of uh, the, the Pacific Coast and will be working with, with them to glean information from, from that work as well. Um, and the county, by the way, is uh, uh, provide, will be providing that information about the actual flood studies in the coming months at, for your participation in as well. So this is good for floods, storms, and tsunamis, but uh, it's not really helpful when the sea rises so that all you have is, uh, so it's continually covering your yard and the local roads. Uh, so that will require a different strategy. Uh, and this is one possible solution. We already have this in Sausalito and it's being done increasingly around the world. Um, just float on top of it. Um, and there are some amazing things being done in uh, the Netherlands and in the northern countries on whole cities that may be floating in this fashion. Another way to think about it is let's let it flood, especially if it's just a flood that is a transitory event, 
let's get out of the way, let it get wet, and then dry it off when we come, uh, when, the, when the water's receded. So this is an actual uh, floodable parking garage in Rotterdam that you see on the top. Another thing that we can do that the county's working on in its watershed program is how can we reduce the peak floods from the terrestrial side so that we're not adding that water to the water level and having it back up against the higher levels of, of water that will be there where it's draining out in the ocean or in Bolinas Lagoon. So this is low impact development, uh, one of the ways that you capture that runoff and get it to seep into the ground uh, and control it in that fashion. And you can always build levees. Uh, something we've <laughs> done. That, they love doing this in Japan, by the way. You would not believe the super levees that they've built in Japan where they've essentially bulldozed whole neighborhoods of high rises in order to raise the level for 500 meters, uh, an additional 30 feet, and then rebuild those buildings back on top. And that's what they've done in Tokyo. And it'll probably keep the water out of the rest of the city. So probably not a, something you want to do in Stinson, I would think. And then one of the things that's being looked at on the bay side of Marin County and, and in this um, San Francisco Bay is this thing called the horizontal levee. Uh, and what that is is a combination of a levee, um, but also a cons the construction and or uh, restitution of an, a wetland area in it. And that knocks the tops off the, the, the waves that uh, Patrick was alluding to and slows, it means you get away with a smaller levee, uh, a less expensive levee, and you preserve and indeed enhance uh, the environmental uh, qualities of an area. So that's one thing that's being looked at on the base side. What we're trying to come up with is what's the corollary of that in a sandy ocean environment, a, a beach environment? Is there something that might work like that? Another thing that's going on on the base side of Marin is the uh, Coastal Conservancy project uh, for the livable shoreline where they're planting sea uh, oyster beds right off of the Rod and Gun Club in Marin. And the idea again there is to knock that peak off of the, the waves and quiet the water so that you bring that, that maximum water level down. You call that, what you call that? Uh, livable shoreline. And then there is the idea of managed retreat. You look at what's going to be coming down the line and you make some hard choices. And you know, you can get out of the way by going up or you can get out of the way by going away. And in fact, in um, Pacifica, they did that. And this is a, a shot of that where they did some restoration of the beach, uh, restoration of the creek that ran into the beach and um, moved a number of structures out of the way of, uh, of flooding and inundation, permanent inundation, uh, as well, uh, you know, they're, they're doing it up in Canada. Uh, easy to do when you don't have a lot of very expensive houses that you have to move, and so that's going to be one of the problems we're going to have to deal with. If it's just moving a barn, okay, we can do that. So, as I indicated before, while we were showing these steps as linear, they really are a process that starts here, goes through this whole process, and then comes back again. And we look at what we learned, we adapt as we go forward. Um, and we, we do that, so it's really a generational thing, continually looking forward, doing monitoring, which is a very important part, seeing what is actually happening so that the models can uh, be, be improved and made more accurate, um, and then learning more about the options that we have. So I think we're gonna have ourselves doing this for quite a while. 
And that's where you guys come in. Um, we we want to get you and your neighbors and the people um, that you know involved in the process. Uh, we, we're kicking off the, the project today with this brief overview and very general approach, but we're going to hold, geez, we're going to hold, <laughs> that guy keeps wanting to come back. We're going to hold a number of community meetings. Uh, we'll have three up and down the coast, one for the Stinson, uh, the Muir Beach, Stinson, Bolinas area, another one, the uh, Point Reyes, Inverness, East Shore area, and then one for the North and Dillon Beach. And we'll be doing that periodically in the next, you know, coming in the fall so that we can get into a closer environment, have maps and papers on the ground and really get down and, and exchange information and, and ideas uh, with, uh, with, with, with all of you. Um, and we'll be doing that again when we get up to the, the adaptation strategies. And then eventually we will be submitting a, one of the things that we had to do in order to get the money was to promise to amend our local coastal program to incorporate what we've learned. So we'll be doing that and there will be public hearings before the Planning Commission and for, before the board as we get down in that direction. And I did mention before that those of you who like to sign up and do a lot of unpaid work, you're, <laughs> you're uh, certainly invited. Uh, let's see, where is Alex? Alex has uh, the, the application forms. And again, they're on our website. Um, and I'll just again leave you with the website. And there's a link on the website to the OCOF website if you didn't get that down. But now we're at the point where we can take some questions. <laughs> and we lived through, those of us from Stinson, I think almost all of us lived through variations of the Independence Day Storm. I'm an educator, Jenny is on the board. We need to start educating the next populations going to the schools because this is going to be their life. This is going to be their challenge. And I don't think we're doing enough to educate at the elementary, middle, and high school levels yet about what these kids will be facing. I, I personally. 100% agree with you, and I would love to Let's take get a your name and work with point. you on that in this area. Uh, that's what I do. Yeah, if you go back to slide number one, yeah. I wanted to point something out to you. Is that where you were? That got me past it. Oh, slide number one. Uh, the, uh, oh. the yeah, two houses oh. on the beach. The, I'm sorry, what? Two houses. Yeah. Oh, the elevated house. house. Uh, yeah, okay. That's Fair. for. The, the house on I'm sorry, the right, is that your house? <laughs> that, no, the house on the right is version number two. Uh -huh. Okay, the previous house was approximately at the same elevation, which was taken away in 82 83. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah. This is the Van Cooligan property. Uh, I helped evacuate those people from that building. Right? The, di the major difference are the pilings are concrete and steel. Previously, they were wood. Oh, yes. And that's exactly the kind of stuff that we need to get down to. One of the things we'll certainly be looking at is building codes. FEMA is going to have requirements for how buildings get built so that they're, I mean, they have requirements, uh, so that they're resistant. And that's probably why that's still standing, aside from the fact that we didn't have well, that 1983. Been, that hasn't been exposed to <laughs> yeah, the it hasn't been, event yeah. yet. I think he was supposed to go ahead. You mentioned requirements. Does that include cash? I mean, for ele for elevation to, to help people that are financially uh, compromised that can't uh, come up with the money to move their houses up out of the way. Well, that's something we'll definitely need to look at, um, and, uh, and and yeah. we've got to get that there met. <laughs> and the lady was mentioning the, the Manzanita the Manzanita parking lot. Uh, how about the Buenos Y? That's uh, right. A cut off of the plane wide. Yeah, there, there are a couple of places that are very obvious even now. And uh, that's why we'll be working with, with Caltrans and, um, and the, our own county department of public works and to see what's you know, coming down the line in those areas. Uh, in the 82 83 storm, 12 homes were washed out to sea. Many of the homes where you walk down the beach now, those were one house in from the beach uh, before the 82 83 storms. 
We didn't lose any lives, and I think it was just a miracle, given the power lines that were down and the terrible weather conditions that went on. When they really hit. Um, I don't know that we can always count on miracles and luck, and I think we're not fully prepared yet for another storm like 82, 83. And when you said it's possible that we're going to have bigger storms over the next five years, I was thinking this. That, that's why we're doing this. Uh, I'm sorry, I think the person next to you, would you raise your hand? Yes, I'm, <coughs> I'm Jane Pfeiffer. I live in Bellinas. I'm on the Bellinas Tinson School Board. Uh, we are right now looking at the potential of putting a, a general obligation bond for um, updating our school because there, of course, there's a lot that needs to be done. But in the meantime, we're having to take all these things into consideration because um, we are already seeing difficulties in the last couple of winters with the flooding in front of the school, in front of both schools, our Stinson campus and the Salinas campus. So I think it's important that we be able to get some input from the county about what we can do about those roads. The Little Bellinas Road is the only way in and out of Bellinas at this time, and it goes right in front of the school. So we, we really need to find out what we are in a position to do and to get the kids in a flooding situation out of the school in Stinson. And we want to we wanna get the, the, the I, I already spoke to another one of your board members, we want to have you part of our our technical advisory committee, those agencies who are working together to see right. what can be done. Right. I think you. Yeah. Um, as you know, there are around the bay uh, levies that were created over the years, a lot of them by the federal government, and a lot of them created before the Coastal Commission existed. Do you know whether the federal government has any intention of improving or um, uh, restoring any of those levies? A lot of which has subsided, some of which have collapsed and whether the Coastal Commission will resist um, improvement of those levies, whether it's done by the federal government or by the property that, is, that they're protecting. Um, I don't know. Um, Chris, too, uh, does, does that ring a bell at all? Um, I guess it would depend on where they are, but there are programs evaluating levies um, <coughs> along both, well, mostly in Eastern Marin now, looking at long-term mm -hmm. evaluation. Okay. And and the coastal commission doesn't have jurisdiction in, in the uh, in the within the bay. That's the Bay Conservation and Development Commission, and they're the ones who are uh, among the groups that are looking at that horizontal levy. So there there is that win-win situation. Yes, uh, we've been looking at the uh, symptoms and uh, of uh, climate change and sea level rise. We also need to look at the systemic causes of why this is happening and uh, uh, to educate the future, I think that was mentioned, and the um, <clears throat> just looking at the big perspective like what's happening in New York in September, uh, Ban Ki-moon has called together the heads of state to come to urge them to come up with a, uh, a, a binding agreement by 2015 in Paris. So uh, some of us can go to New York and push them on the street. Binding agreement for what? Hey, pardon? A binding agreement for what? To a reduce car carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. And I will point out that the county is, is beginning with its update of its current greenhouse gas emissions uh, inventory and emissions plan. It's called uh, the uh, Climate Action Plan. And that will be coming up for public hearings in, I think, later in the uh, fall or winter. And um, I'm wondering if those of you who are interested in that, um, it, it's our, our staff person is Dana, Dana Armanino. But if you call, just call the community development agency and, and say that you're, you're interested in that, she'll definitely put you on the list. And so that's the other side of the equation. And, you know, what can we do here as compared to India and China, but we have to do our part. Yes. In a situation that has so many variables, uh, why not just 
plan for the worst case scenario and, and get it over with. Then you don't have to take into consideration all of the other possibilities and you just go for the broke thing. That's, I think that's it. You would go for broke. <laughs> because the cost, <laughs> the cost of dealing with that, I mean, I, I think that's a great idea. But I mean, you talk about the 100 year storm. Why not just plan for it? Yeah. And that's, that's, that's part of We don't have the answers to this whole thing. You know, we're, we're talking about working, uh, you know, working together to get to those answers. And maybe that's the way we want to go. Um, maybe it turns out that in certain areas, that worst case isn't all that much different than, than what would be a little uh, less effective, and maybe you go the extra mile there. But that's, I wish I had a better idea of how this is all gonna come out. I, I usually, when I get into a planning program, I, I, I know what the possible endpoints are. This one, not so much. <laughs> yes? Well, there, I, I just don't see how we could deal with that position as what we're going to do. We, at this point, do not have enough to have the Federal Highway Administration pay for the road projects that are in the pipeline right now. How the hell are we going to do something? So it's not that problem. We just do the 100 year, yeah, it's the worst case. Let's do it. It's the part of the promise of having some of this information is to inspire a, the potential for increasing awareness and money because right now i mean i'm not i mean i'm sure that people in the room are aware that we do not for this fiscal year do not have enough money to pay for the federal highway administration projects um, uh, any more questions oh yes go ahead. uh yes yeah, the coastal commission sort of adjusting the to adaptive construction. I mean, it seems like their history is sort of much more aesthetic and environmental than, than now we need to see the, property. The Coastal Commission has put out a draft set of guidelines for how they will address the um, challenges of sea level rise. I would very much um, uh, ask all the people here to go to the Coastal Commission site and take a look at those and be involved in that process. You can find on that site also letters that have been written about those draft guidelines, and you'll find one from the community, uh, the, the county of Marin, which doesn't quite agree with their approach. And so that will, for people who actually live right along the shoreline or who live in the appeal area, which is another map that we'll put up at some point, and that will affect a significant, a significant number of people in these areas. You could be subject to those guidelines, so you want to take a look at those and be involved in the process of developing them. And those, we'll have a link to that on our website as well. Scott. Yeah, Jack, um, all of the different, you just referred to websites. I was at a meeting last night where Supervisor Sears gave her presentation on her pilot project. State Insurance Commission uh, administrators were there. They gave their websites. It seems appropriate now to have a clearinghouse somewhere in the county where we don't have to jump around to 15 different local, city, state, and national websites. Somebody needs to take charge and make a clearinghouse so we can put all this together. If you want us to be advocates, through a stakeholder said, we need to give people one website that they can go to. It's one shop, one stop shopping. So yeah. One rule. I, ch I challenge you. One ring to rule them all. Huh? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, again, I want to thank you. Uh, I do want to let you out here somewhere near the time that we, we promised, and I very much appreciate you uh, coming here. If you go to the website, you'll see a subscribe button right at the top of, a, of that web page. Uh, we will now assume that when you gave us your, your web address here, that you want us to, to put you into the, the system. So we'll be doing that. But again, friends and neighbors, get the word out. Um, we probably won't have the budget to send a card to everybody on the coast again for quite a while. 
but we did want to get your attention this time around. So from here on out, it's uh, talking neighbor to neighbor, friend to friend, and uh, we look forward to working with you. And we'll be sending out emails to you to let you know what's coming up and what we're doing next. So again, really great thanks to Patrick and to Mike uh, for coming out here. That, that is uh, a high class act that we have associated with and, and we're very happy to do that. So thank you.